Well, listen, welcome. We're very, very glad to have each and every one of you. Um, I do have a bone to pick with you guys. I do. I do. Um, I tell you what, God has really been doing in my heart um, a work. I don't know about you guys, but um, I've got this I've got this battle going on. Some of you know that I, I took this new job, and I'm really excited about it. And I need to be thinking about that job. It's, it's tough, it's challenging, and I need to be thinking about that. But I tell you, there's a battle because I can only think about this church and you guys. <laughs> and, um, and, and throughout the week and in my devotions and as I'm driving, I, need, I just, every one of your faces come to mind and uh, God is just impressing on me to pray for you all. And uh, I, I almost had to pray and ask him to just ease up a bit, you know? <laughs> just like, I can't, I can't do this, you know? It just, but I just want you to know that uh, I love you guys. You're on my heart. I'm praying for you. And I hope I'm on your heart. And I hope you're praying for me, too, because I certainly need it. Right, Andy? I need it. I need it. I wasn't going to say anything. Yes. All right. And then one thing, um, we'll hold kind of announcements for the very, very end, but, but keep in mind today, we are going to do the, the question and answer session after the service. And if you can't stay, that's fine. But if you're interested and you have some questions in regard to our bylaws and constitution and our statement of, of doctrine, faith, all of that, um, the, the, the four elders here will be up up and we'll set a table here and we'll just start taking <coughs> questions from you so if you're interested in that please stay afterwards and we'll we'll go as long as you have questions um, and then we'll go from there so let's just go ahead and open up a prayer father we uh, we thank you for once again an opportunity to come together as believers that we could share fellowship with one another that we could encourage each other in the faith um, God that's what that's why we come together um, and, and God I pray that you just prepare each one of us to serve others here in, in this room, to, um, to pray for one another, to be concerned for one another, uh, to, to serve and, and meet needs whenever you show it to us. And Lord, we do invite you to this service this morning. We, we welcome your presence. We need it. We desperately need your presence. And God, just through the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you, we, you give us the ability to um, not only listen to the word that, that Pastor Andy is preaching today, but that we would be readily willing to apply it. Um, God, use us as vessels. You've gifted every one of us in a special way, and I just pray that uh, you make that clear to each one of us um, how you want us to use those gifts in serving you. And we pray this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can somebody help this guy? <laughs> I need it. <laughs> you need more than what any of us can do. <laughs> well, I hope you guys had a good week. We missed being here with you last week. We went up for my mom's 70th birthday party in Kentucky and woke up on Sunday morning to go to church to this white stuff all over the ground <laughs> and uh, had an adventure up there and made it home safe and, and throughout the week and been an adventurous week for us. So. We're continuing in our series through 1 Corinthians, and up until this point, Paul's been dealing with the issues he saw and heard about in the church. But now he switches gears and he answers some specific questions that this church had asked him. I've heard some very strong preaching and some opinions about what Paul says in this section, and there may not be another section of scripture that has been more abused and pulled out of context than this one that we're looking at today. And, and here's how it works. If you put the next one up there, it's the next one. Come on, Tim, wake up. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Important issues plus differing opinions equals what? Controversy. Controversy. And we've all seen controversy in church, haven't we? Yep. Where people who have different opinions and they dig down on them and they feel like their opinion is right because... We all know our opinions are always right, and everyone else will get straightened out later. And then there's controversy that comes in, and that's exactly what we have here in this passage. And when we, when we read and study this passage, we can't turn a blind eye to the culture 
of the people who that this was written to. In other words, we can't read this passage like Paul wrote it today to modern day America. Although there's a lot of similarities and applications that we can put in, but in proper her hermeneutics, which is the study of the Bible, I threw that big word in there just for Dave because I needed something big to make me sound smart like him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've succeeded today. <laughs> yeah, in, in studying the Bible, it, it's kind of like in real estate, the three rules of real estate. What are the three rules of real estate? Location. Yep, location, location, location. And in studying the Bible, there's three rules. Context, context, context. You always have to come back to the context because you can take a verse or two and put them together, take them out of context, and you can make them say whatever you want, like this. Matthew 27, 5 says, Then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out and hanged himself. Look at the next verse. Then Jesus said, Yes, now go and do the same. <laughs> you can take the Bible and twist it and pull it out of context and make it say whatever you want it to say. So it's important for us to make sure we've, got, we've just got to be so careful to keep the context of the passage accurate. And we saw in chapter 6 that Paul was teaching this church, these people in this city, to avoid sexual sins, which included the temple prostitutes that were here. And he actually said to run from it in verse 18. In this culture, in this, this, this time period, men basically used women for, just to fulfill their sexual desires. And women in this culture would get upset with their, their husbands and they would turn around and withhold physical intimacy from their husbands for all kinds of reasons to put pressure on them because they were going out and fulfilling their desires outside of their marriage. So the church comes to Paul with this question. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now regarding the questions you asked me in your letter. Boy, I wish we had that letter. That would be a cool letter to read. <laughs> like, what were these people asking Paul? But we can kind of reverse engineer Paul's answer to get their question. Regarding the question you asked me in your letter, yes, it's good to abstain from sexual relations. Paul tells them it's good not to have sexual relations outside of marriage. Now, some translations take this verse and they say, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Have you ever heard that or read that in a translation of the Bible? Yeah. And I've heard preaching on that that says that touch is a touch that lights a fire. And, and then you got to figure out, well, what kind of touch is it? Or is it any touch or anything like that? And, and, and it's, what it is, is it's a, that, that phrase, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. It's a literal translation of an ancient idiom. So it was a saying that they had that those translations translated literally instead of trying to get the point. Can you imagine another culture and another time period trying to understand some of our idioms? Well, I need that like I need a hole in the head. Can you imagine reading that, you know, and to, to these people, wow, those people wanted a hole in their head? I mean, there's all kinds of sayings that we have that wouldn't make sense to other people. And if it's translated literally, it can be very hard to understand. But this phrase has the intent of sexual relations, not a simple touch. If it literally meant that we couldn't touch, if a, it's, a man could not touch a woman, then that means you couldn't even shake hands. Or you couldn't hug somebody that you're close to. Or you couldn't, I mean, there's all kinds of things that, that it would. So I believe that's kind of a, I hate to say a bad translation, but it's a literal translation of this saying. And it leads people to believe something that's not actually in the Bible. And that the Bible's not teaching. Verse 2. But... Because there's so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. This culture, again, was rampant with immorality. And, but this teaching is not saying that physical intimacy is bad. It teaches us that there's a proper place for it, and that is inside of marriage. Like I said before, the women in this culture would withhold physical intimacy to try to get their husbands to come home instead of going to all of these other places to fulfill their desires and be, because the men That's would just the go everywhere. thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Which part? It, that would make them go out. And do I know, <laughs> but that's what the culture did. So because you're doing what I don't want, I'm going to do something that you don't want that's going to drive you further away. It doesn't make sense, but it's what they did. Um, it's crazy. 
But it still happens today. It, it still happens in, in relationships today. But the women would do that, and so it would just drive, and that's the next thing. Is the men, they would drive the men further away. And they would go out, and they'd fulfill their desires wherever they could. So what does Paul say? Paul says, no. Men, intimacy is for your wife. Ladies, intimacy is for your husband. Verse 3, the husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband. And when Paul said this, I can just see all the men stand up and start clapping. You know, <laughs> yes, get her. <laughs> uh, but it's, he didn't stop there. He goes on and says, and the husband gives authority over his body to the wife. And just as quickly as they stood up, I can see him sitting down in the air getting sucked out of the room. <laughs> because men in this culture did what they wanted to with their bodies. So this was like a radical new way of thinking for them. But Paul even goes further. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You know, a lot of people in, in many religions think that the Bible is very anti-sex. Or they think that some religions teach that physical intimacy, sex, is only just for procreation. But Paul's really clear here in this. Paul was very pro-regular physical intimacy in marriage. So the question that I get most of the time when talking about this is, well, how often is frequent? <laughs> Guess who asks that question most of the time? Men. And the answer, I believe, is different for everybody. And when you start to be tempted, it's been too long. And I'm going to leave that right there. We'll save that for counseling. <laughs> and we're going to let Tim handle all that counseling. <laughs> Tim's like red as a beat right now. <laughs> he's not used to talking like this in church. <laughs> he's reading the notes ahead and going, he's going to say that? <laughs> The only exception to this, though, is a time for fasting and, for, and time of fasting for intimacy um, for the purpose of prayer. It's where we set aside things and we, we fast from food or sometimes we'll fast from media or we'll fast from different things in life. And Paul says that we can actually fast from sex for the purpose of drawing closer to Christ. It, it's, it, but he says, as soon as that mutually agreed upon time is over, get back together quickly so you're not tempted to sin sexually. Verse 6, I say this as a concession, not as a command. So what Paul's saying here is I'm about to give you my opinion, not a command from God. He says this, verse 7, I wish everyone were single just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. So I say to those who aren't married and to the widows, it's better to stay unmarried just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with lust. Now, Paul was a single man. How many of you have ever heard that Paul was never married? That's what I was taught my whole life. I, I believe, you know. And, but then I, as I studied and read this, there's a whole other side of people who believe that that Paul was married and that either his wife left him when at his conversion or that she could have died. And here's their, their reasoning for that. They said because Paul was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin before he came to Christ. And in that culture, young men were expected to marry about age 12. And to be a member of the Sanhedrin, marriage was actually a requirement. So the scripture doesn't tell us whether Paul was ever married, but it does tell us he was single at this point in his life. And it's better for us just to not assume things. The Bible doesn't tell us and where the Bible's not clear, we don't need to draw hard lines, but where the Bible is clear, that's where we draw hard lines. So it's just something I thought I'd throw out there to get you to think about a little bit because it made me think a little bit this week. So scripture doesn't tell us whether he was, but we know he was single right now. And because he was single, he was able to focus all of his time and all of his energy on serving God, where a married man or a woman has to focus on the needs of their family as well as serving God. So Paul says that his singleness, being able to focus on uh, serving God was a gift from God. Not everybody's given that gift. I know I wasn't given that gift. I'd be a mess if it weren't for my wife. I'd forget everything. I'd, I'd 
wouldn't be where I'm supposed to be. You're not supposed to shake your head that adamantly. <laughs> um, any of you guys feel that way? Yeah. <clears throat> that was a good way to earn some brownie points. You did good right there, guys. Good job. <laughs> Dave put his hand up again. <laughs> Extra points for Dave. <laughs> <laughs> oh man Paul goes on in verse 10 but for those who are married I have a command so he's gone from opinion now I'm telling you what I think to now I have a command that comes not from me but from the Lord a wife must not leave her husband if she does leave him let her remain single or else be reconciled to him and the husband must not leave his wife Paul's basically te telling us that his wish is for everybody to be single but that's his preference now he's giving a command from God, and that is that once we're married, we're not supposed to leave our spouse. Now I believe that there are some exceptions for that, and infidelity is taught in the scripture as one of the cases and, uh, of, for that. And I believe there's also a case that could be made for abuse. I, I don't believe God would want a woman to stay in a relationship with a man who is constantly abusing her or physically hurting her and those kind of things. So I believe there are exceptions to this rule, and, and they're taught in scripture. But the principle, the overall principle in marriage is that until death do us part. We actually say that as a part of our marriage vows, till death do us part. Um, my dad used to, or my mom used to always say we'd never consider divorce but murder a few times. <laughs> um, so there's that way out. But we're, uh, <laughs> Tim jumped and Ernesto's reaching for his handcuffs. <laughs> Oh. But this can be really a controversial passage in Scripture. But in it, I believe there's some lessons that we can pull out and we can apply to us today. Here's the first one. It's my duty and responsibility to meet my spouse's physical needs to help keep them from being tempted to sin sexually. It's not just my responsibility, it's my duty as well. Paul says it really clearly for us. In verse 3, he says, The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. Skip down to verse 5. It says, do not deprive each other of sexual relations. Satan tempts a married couple when they're not together physically. It's a way that he can get a foothold in. And God's given each of us a responsibility and an ability to keep our mate from being tempted in that area. This was a survey that was done this last year, 2022. And according to this general social survey, men are more likely to cheat than women with 20% of men and 13% of women reported having sex with someone other than their partner while still married. Now that's a number that was overall not just Christianity but everybody. That's just a, a wide survey. And the sad thing is, it's, is that the numbers are exactly the same for people who claim to be Christians. And that's kind of sobering and it's sad to think that that happens. Now, I'm not saying that if you are regularly intimate with your spouse, that infidelity and temptation will never be a problem because Satan is a master deceiver and we as people are fallen sinners. And if he can get a foothold in there, he's going to do everything he can because he wants to destroy marriages and he's looking for every opportunity he can to destroy the home. So Satan is always looking to destroy us. But when we remain separate from our spouse for too long, temptation seems to multiply. Second lesson we can learn is there is supposed to be a mutual submission in our marriage. In other words, my body doesn't belong to me. It belongs to my spouse and vice versa. Verse 4 says the wife gives authority over her body to her husband and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. We each submit to each other. Over and over in the scripture, we see the principle of putting the needs of others above their own. Now, above our own. Now, as I was studying this and as I was working on my message, I was, uh, I was at a place sitting at a table and um, a guy walked over and wanted the table I was sitting at and got really nasty and called me some names because he's like, you can't take this table. This is my table. And I, I looked at him like, what? He's like, did you reserve this table? And I said, no, I didn't know you could reserve a table. Well, you can. You need to. Be. I'm like, dude, I I'm just sitting here studying just, and I kind of, I, I was dumbfounded a little bit. And it happened right as I was writing this. <laughs> and I kind of got a little short with him, honestly. I got a little bit in the flesh. I'm like, dude, just leave me alone. I just, I sitting way back here in the back corner so that I'm not bothered. Just, just leave me alone. And the guy left. 
And he went, mm-hmm. and he sat over in another corner, and I could just hear him. He, he was, well, that you, blankety, blankety, blank, blank, blank. And I'm sitting there thinking, all over a stupid table. <laughs> so I sat there for a minute, and I looked down at my notes, and I had just written that, uh, where's it at? <laughs> We're each supposed to put uh, the needs of others ahead of ourselves. And then I wrote, but this is supposed to, and it says, but we're to do this in every area of life, not just in marriage, but especially in marriage. And I thought, dadgummit. (laughs) So I got up and I moved and I looked at him and I said, if you really want the table, you can have the table. I'll sit over here in a chair. And then he looked at me and goes, oh, now you're being reasonable. (laughs) And it was everything I could do just to look at him. And I actually said, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, buddy. Just take the table. (laughs) And I went over and sat down. I could hear him just continually mumble. And in my flesh, I wanted to walk over and tell him what I really thought. And it was hard because I was almost done with, with my time studying. And, and I, as I, was, I stood up to leave, I turned around and looked at him. And I'm just being real honest right now. I wanted to go over there so bad. Because the owner of the place walks over to me and says, Did you just yell at that guy? And I said, What? He goes, Yeah, that guy came up and said, You were being a real jerk to him. And, and all this stuff. I said, but I know the owner. And I said, listen, because they're one of our custom, one of my customers at work. I said, if I was being a jerk, I'd still be sitting back there. He goes, okay, you got a good point. And then he walked away. <laughs> but when I stood up to leave, I thought about this is what, and it was such a temptation. And I, I wanted to walk back and say, dude, you went up and complained. What are we three? Are we toddlers? You want to complain about a seat? But I stood up, and the Lord said, don't you dare go over there. Don't you do it. And I just, I mumbled under my breath, he's not worth it. It's not worth it. I'm leaving. And I had to physically tell myself to leave, so I left. But it was right when I was, right when I was writing this. I'm going to start writing messages on being a millionaire and <laughs> living in Hawaii and God's blessings. And I'm going to start writing that kind of stuff instead of this. But... It was, uh, it, was, it was amazing, the timing. It was, I had just written it and looked up, and there he's standing up at me, yelling at me. So I had to practice what I was preaching. But we are supposed to put the needs of others above our own. We're supposed to honor and prefer others, not just in our marriages. We're supposed to do it in every area of our life, but especially in our marriages. And that, that may mean that I have to give up what I want or what I deserve or what I feel like is my right because of putting his needs or her needs above my own. So we each put the needs of our spouse above our own and then something happens that's really special. I'm not focused on me anymore. And that's, that's, a, that's a big thing because infidelity always starts in the mind. We think about it and what's my, it starts because I want my rights and I want something that my partner's not doing or I want this or I want, and it starts from a selfish place of focusing on self. And when we're focused on the needs of our spouse, it changes our whole way of life. When I'm focused on my spouse and their needs and not focused on mine, and if I live that way, I can have heaven on earth. And I'm not going to be tempted to step out on my marriage. Here's the third one. Intimacy in marriage is God's plan, but a time of fasting for intimacy, for prayer, can be a good thing. Verse 5. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree so this is not one of us looking at the other one and saying nope i'm gonna pray this is both of us agreeing i just want to be real clear right there where'd my wife go (laughs) i'm just kidding (laughs) please don't tell her i said that there'll be a lot of prayer in our house Tim is really red now. <laughs> I just feel sorry for your kids right now. They're probably going to puke up in their mouth. <laughs> Ooh, Lord have mercy. You know, that's one of the things about when you go section by section. You can't skip stuff. And this is in the Bible. And we're supposed to teach the whole counsel of God. Yeah. Let me try to read verse 5 again. <laughs> Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless... You both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so that you can give yourselves more completely to prayer 
Afterwards, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. There can be a time that we both mutually agree to abstain from intimacy for spiritual purposes. But this should not be an excuse for one person. This is a mutually agreed upon set time. And that can be a special time to focus on prayer and our relationship with Christ. But it's not supposed to be for long periods of time. And when that time is over, we're to come back together again with each other because Satan, again, would like to destroy our marriage. He'd like nothing more than that because he's after marriages, especially Christian marriages. Because, you know, I, I, I grew up here, and did you ever hear the stat that over 50% of marriages end in divorce, even in Christianity? Yeah, that's not an actual true statistic. Um, the real statistic is much better than that. As I was reading through this, I was reading study after study after study after study, and I kept finding these guys saying they don't know where that number came from. Uh, Barna talks about it, and a bunch of other Christian statisticians talk about it. You know, as preachers, you know, my, <laughs> I know one preacher who usually jokes and says, am I preaching or telling the truth? So I think it got <laughs> kind of, the story got bigger each time it was told. But the actual number for the divorce rate in America in 2022 was 33%. Now, the sad thing is, it was 33% amongst Christians, too. It was the exact same as it was amongst the rest of the world. And in that study, they broke down the denominations, what the divorce rate were in denominations of religion. Anybody want to guess what the number one denomination that saw divorce in their midst was? Huh? Which one? Nope, wasn't Catholic. It's Baptist. <laughs> Baptists had the number one divorce rate amongst Christians. Well, it's good they were not denominational. That's, they were number two. <laughs> <laughs> yep, non-denominationals were number two. Um, which is sad. That's, that's a really sick statistic because the divorce rate amongst Christians should be almost non-existent. We shouldn't be stepping out. We shouldn't be leaving our spouse. And if we'd focus on our relationship with God first and then focus on our relationship with our, our spouse second, we won't have to worry about divorce in our church and in our, in our fellowship and our family. Because if we'll keep Christ first, our spouse will always be second. If we'll keep him as our number one, our spouse will always be our number two. So, normally this is where we stop and talk about it, but I don't know that anybody really wants to talk about this. <laughs> Tim, Tim, you want to well, talk? Do you want to share yeah. personal experience? Yeah. Well, I, I will make a comment. Ruby, that I, put your fingers in your ears. <laughs> and go, no, 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 no. I, I want to compliment you for being bold enough to talk about a subject that you necessarily might not equate with church. I have never talked about this in church before. I've never preached out of this passage ever in 20 years. But, but here's the thing. Just like you pointed out, it's in the Word. Let's learn it. Let's apply it. And, and when you think about it, that's the reason why Bible study is so important, because it touches every part of our life. And if we read it, apply it, live in it, then we'll know how to live a holy life, right? There's another aspect that when, when you talk about the husband and wife both mutually <coughs> giving dominion over their bodies to each other, there is a word in there that was not mentioned, and it's trust. Mm -hmm. Trust is crucial in yep. marriage. Absolutely. You're right there. <coughs> Anybody else? Um, I think that should also include um, just general affection mm -hmm. and an emotional connection. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. There is more to cheating than just physical cheating. There's emotional cheating. There's there's all kinds of things. You're absolutely right. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. And it's crickets. I know. I, I know some people are thinking, ooh, this was a tough one. Some are like, man, I'm glad I came to church today. <laughs> so maybe thinking, I, I wish this person was listening or that person was listening. <laughs> I think it's worse that churches don't talk about it. Yeah, I agree. Because then stuff ends up happening, and even then it's just thrown under the rug, and everyone's like, shh, 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 shh don't say this, don't say that. But God created it for a reason, and, and yeah, one of the biggest parts of your life, really. So, I mean, 
We're the ones that make it weird. The Bible doesn't make it weird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We make it weird. It's Bill? Kind of weird. <laughs> I think, too, that, you know, Paul is emphasizing how important marriage is, you know, and uh, you not have sex outside of marriage for people that aren't married, too, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, we need to, you know, teach that to our children and our yeah. grandchildren, you know, how important that is, uh, you know, because with that part of our bodies and ourselves, it, it just becomes, when we give that part of ourselves to somebody without marriage, it just ruins things for, you know, our life down the road. You know? Yeah, that's why he dealt with it in six. He dealt with fornication, sin of the flesh, you know, before marriage, during marriage, and then this one he deals with marriage. And I always heard that, you know, being intimate with someone outside of marriage is kind of like plywood. You know, it, you take all these particles and they get glued together. And then when you try to separate those two people after being intimate with one another, it's like trying to rip plywood apart. It just splinters all over the place because we've given our soul, our spirit to another person. And there's never a clean break there. It, it's very ugly and it's very painful. And it's something that we don't have to put ourselves through. And I like to know what the statistics are in the church as far as that too because it seems like it's about the same you know people, mm -hmm. like they uh they just you know well, well we'll get married later but right now we're just going to sleep together and you know yeah and i wonder what the statistics are on that even in the church compared to the world too yeah they're pretty close if my memory is right because i read a bunch of that stuff this week and i don't remember the exact numbers but if they weren't the same they're real close Problem is, people look at getting married like buying a used car. You know, I want to take it for a test drive and try it out for first and see if I like it, and then I'll buy it. And that's not God's intent. I, I think it's important that we do point out is that just because you failed doesn't mean you've been rejected. Absolutely. There is forgiveness, always forgiveness at the foot of the cross. And restoration and, and all of that. Absolutely. And uh, and I'm I'm glad for that. We we cannot mess up enough to where God says, "Yep, giving up on you." So um, once you've been forgiven, there is no shame either. That's right. right. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Yep. The blood of Christ washes us clean. Yep. That's a part of the story, though, that we can use to help others down the road. Absolutely. I think that's why I think God uses our I wanted to say mistakes, but our bad decisions to help others later in life, yep. if we'll allow him to. Right. can take our story and rewrite it. Yeah. For sure. We can't look down on those that have failed either because uh, mm -mm. the Bible says that if a man looks at a woman with lust, he's already committed Absolutely. Adultery. How many of us can say we've never done that? Yeah. Yeah. Are you looking around, Tim? To see if somebody raised it? That was a little awkward. <laughs> wow. Yeah, absolutely, Bill. Matthew just talk, uh, Jesus talks about that in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. If you look on a woman to lust after, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. And there's none of us that are clean from that. There's also a stigma against people sometimes staying single and he doesn't put single people down he's like no. you can he elevates it the, yeah so sometimes we gotta do, remember that if we're trying to push somebody or whatever thinking that's what they need to do yep absolutely paul elevates it dave you mentioned context earlier uh i heard a preacher one time uh preach that if you look upon a woman that includes your wife Oh, wow. And I'm thinking, you kind of missed the context. Uh, <laughs> yep, missed that one. Yeah. <laughs> I sin every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this confession is good for the soul. <laughs> that got awkward quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's wrap this up. Okay. <laughs> What's next on the, I need to stop talking. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have an elders meeting later, and yeah. I'm in yeah. trouble. <laughs> Have you come up, Dave, wherever you are? You're going to do it now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be an excommunication. <laughs> hey, just, just, just a couple of things before we have the Q&A session. We'll give you a couple of minutes if you need to leave. That's fine. 
Uh, we're also going to set up a table here so we can sit up here and, um, and talk. Um, so, got another opportunity for service for somebody in the room. We're going to start uh, signing people in as they come in. And then if we have visitors, we're going to get them registered. And we've got a program. Uh, we're going to have an iPad. Um, and then just somebody stand right here as people come in. And all you need to do as soon as, let's say, that um, Ernesto and Michelle come, well, they come all the time. They'll already be in there. All you need is just push their name, just like a button, and, and they're registered. The thing is, if we have a, a visitor come in, we want to be able to get their information, if, if, if they're willing, uh, get them put in. And then what we're going to do, and this is the second opportunity for service, is we'll have one or two or three people here that are gifted in this way. Send them a thank you card with a little, just a, a personal note, just appreciating that they came and visited. And uh, we're also going to start putting like a little $5 QT card gift card in, in that and be sent off to the visitors. We just want to know we, we, we're we glad they came and just encourage them to come back. And so uh, I'll repeat. So there's two opportunities for service. One, signing people in, greeting them when they come in. And two, sending a personal note. And it would be nice if there was multiple people doing that so that just not one person has that. But we're going to give you the cards. We're going to give you the postage. All, you, all we need from you is your heart. That's it. Right? Okay. Um, and let's see if there's anything else. I think that's it. We'll have Dave close out, and then we'll just give us a couple of minutes to set up, and then we'll get started on that, okay? Before I close, most of you know that... Uh, Does it pray for Karen? She had a surgery. Oh, that's right, Karen Klein. Her, yeah. What day is her surgery, Con? Tuesday. 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 Yeah, let's, we'll, we'll keep her in our prayers. Uh, before I close, most of you know that evil has come to Kansas City. <laughs> It arrived yesterday from the, from the, from the east. <laughs> and so land of Mordor, which we, but, which we now call Cincinnati. <laughs> so you might include in your prayers that the forces of good can repel these hordes of evil that have come to our city. So, uh, uh, but let's, uh, we'll seriously close now. <laughs> Dear Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to learn more about your word. Lord, we know that, uh, that you don't pull any punches, Father. It's there to help us live our lives. Uh, Lord, and it's up to us to study it in proper context uh, and let you speak to every area of our life. Father, we pray also for Karen, our sister Karen. Lord, bless her. Uh, give her peace in her heart and comfort. And Father, give the uh, uh, doctors uh, uh, great ability and help them to diagnose her. Father, we pray that she would be negative for cancer mm -hmm. and that you would give her a complete healing. Mm -hmm. Father, be with us now during our time of question and answers. Father, we pray you give us a spirit of great unity uh, and togetherness, dear Lord. Uh, Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for all your blessings. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.